Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We are live in Studio B alongside Jerem Jordan. I am Spencer Linton. It is our privilege now on a Tuesday to welcome an ESPN college football insider and expert, Trevor Maddich. Not for a Maddich Monday, but for a Maddich Tuesday. A Trevor Tuesday. Tom Homo took over with his Yoda costume yesterday, Tom, uh, Trevor, so we kind of pushed you today, but that's okay. We can't think of a better way to start off November, and in the spirit of Halloween and Mike Leach, what's your favorite candy to consume on Halloween as you get ready for November? Oh, it's candy corn. There, <laughs> there is no other. And for the haters of candy corn, what they need to do is just keep eating it until they learn to love it. Got it? <laughs> Sound like me with my daughter and, uh, you know, uh, cheese pizza. Or what, but eat the pepperoni, after all. Strong opinions already <laughs> being shared on this show. Trevor, as BYU football moves into November, Kalani Satake said yesterday, new month, new week, new game, new opportunity. How does BYU begin to salvage this season, if they can at all? Well, there's too much of a burden from what's happened the last four weeks to try to think about that and think about correcting it. What they need to do is just wipe the slate clean and treat this game as if it's the last game they'll ever play, as if it is the Super Bowl. And that means not the game. That means preparation for the game. That means a fanatical urgency in practice to get ready. Nick, Samus, Nick Saban famously said that the will to win is not what matters. It's the will to prepare to win. And I've got to say that through all the injuries and all the things that have happened with this team, on tape too often it appears like the players weren't fanatically focused with urgency in practice. Now, in fairness, I wasn't at practice. I'm just saying what it looks like on tape. But they need to just wipe the slate clean, start this week as if this is the only week that will ever be in their football lives. Let's talk about injuries, because certainly those have played uh, a big factor in what's happened this year. So we could just say, yeah, BYU's been injured. Uh, that's why. But then we go to, well, why is BYU being so injured? It feels like, and I even questioned Blaine Fowler last week on this, and he had some uh, you know, good research having talked to doctors as he is connected in the medical world and connected to Stanford and whatnot. feels like BYU is a little more banged up than the, the average team. So is there something you can do to prevent injuries? Is this return missionary soft tissue stuff? I know it's not all RMs per se, but it's certainly concerning that in a year like this that is – comparable or closer to what BYU is going to start playing in the Big 12, that, hey, if BYU can't get through seasons without being overly injured, then they're going to have a tough time in the Big 12. There is a lot of data on this, and it is something that the, their medical staff and strength and conditioning staff and coaches need to make sure they're focused on. A lot of times injuries happen in freak fashion. Sometimes, like in the case of BYU, they're kind of playing above their recruiting level sometimes where they've got a whole bunch of power five schools all bunched up and then they don't recruit to that yet all the way. As BYU gets into the Big 12 and they get full recruiting cycles, then the depth will be such that they'll be able to deal with those injuries better. But it does happen when you're kind of punching above your weight class a little bit. They wouldn't want to say that, but it's kind of the truth. And so you need to make sure that there's a balance between how hard you go in practice, how hard you go in the weight room, and then how hard you want to play and stay, stay healthy on game day because you can overdo it in practice and in the weight room. I'm not saying that they are, but I'm saying that these are things that they have to watch out for. Trevor, against ECU, BYU was down arguably their four best defenders. Malik Moore at safety, their two best linebackers in Peyton Wilgar and Max Tooley, and then their best cover corner in D'Angelo Mandel. If the, it is a scenario where BYU has to go to Boise State with none of those guys, or maybe one or two even, how do they handle something like that when we're going up against Boise State in a place they have not played well? Well, it, the injuries are a thing. They're not an excuse, but it's important to acknowledge some of the limitations that occur because of that. Because when you've got enough guys injured, you can't really run a practice correctly. I mean, well, especially on defense where BYU has had trouble on game day with tackling, for example. If you wear guys out in practice because so many guys are sitting out practice, that makes it even worse on game day. And it also means that you can't practice as hard and as fast as you want to because you're running out of people. And you don't want to wear him out. And so I, I, I remember talking to Lane Kiffin when he was head coach at USC. Now he's the head coach at Ole Miss. And it was during the, the Reggie Bush sanction years. And so they had limitations in scholarships from the NCAA. And Coach Kiffin was telling me how with those limitations and then injuries to the offensive line, they couldn't even run a proper practice because they didn't have enough offensive linemen. And that affected the entire team. Uh, a few years before that, I was at Florida 
when they had uh, a coaching change and they said that in spring ball they couldn't run practice because they didn't have enough scholarship or healthy offensive linemen. So Florida put out a call to campus for any guys that played high school or maybe junior college offensive line that still were in shape enough to come in and help them practice. And they got a bunch of guys just to help them practice off of campus. So it's, it's a thing when you've got so many uh, injuries that practice becomes difficult. But even so, the guys that are practicing need to have that fanatical focus and urgency on what they're doing. And it can't always be as physical as the coaches want it to be because you got to keep guys ready to play. But at the same time, that mental urgency at least needs to be there. And BYU too often has played like they didn't have the, the fanatical mental urgency in practice. Now, in fairness, I wasn't there, but I – I see what they look like on tape, and that's what it looks like to me. So they can improve on that side of it. Having said all that, a lot of the problems that BYU has had, especially on defense, have started with not being in the right place, doing the right thing with the right technique. In other words, before they were engaged with an opponent, before any physical limitations came in, their pad level was too high. They got out of their gap. They didn't set an edge. And then when, like Mike Tyson has said, and we've talked about this, guys, that when everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And when you're engaged now with the opponent, the opponent has something to say about it. But there have been too many times when BYU, especially on defense, has not started the play correctly, and that led to you know, football disasters as the play continued on. So injuries are important. They're a thing. We need to acknowledge that. That's not an excuse. But what that means is that fanatical focus on alignment assignment technique needs to be apparent from practice coming into the game, at least before you engage with the opponent. Okay, let's ask you about uh, Boise State and then the new Big 12 deal here in the next couple of minutes that we have. Boise State started 2-2. Two and two. They fired Tim Plow, the OC. Dirk Cutter was an analyst on the staff, former head coach there. He is now the OC. Things have turned around. They've won four in a row. They've got uh, uh, an offense that doesn't put up a ton of points a game or yards, but their defense is top 12 in yards, points, and third downs. Do you feel like the BYU offense can go in there and challenge that very good Bronco defense? Well, it'll be tough because of injuries for BYU with wide receivers, running backs. And this is where, again, the offensive line, which is still deep and experienced and strong and talented and big, this is where the offensive line needs to take over. This is an offensive line game. And so to, to move the ball and to keep up, now it's for the big guys to show why they've gotten so many accolades coming into this season for being possibly one of the best offensive lines that BYU has ever had. They haven't played that way a lot of this season for various reasons. Now they have a chance to get that, that expectation back up to expectation. But on the defensive side, this is, this is a problem because Boise State, you know, they, they fired their offensive coordinator earlier in the season, their starting quarterback, then transferred out because he didn't like what was going on with that, and they got better. And what they've done is created – a rushing attack, a downhill power rushing attack that now has, after a slow start, the Boise rushing attack third in the Mountain West and getting better. And for a banged-up BYU defense, that's a problem. Trevor, for BYU fans, I guess they don't have to focus on the four-game losing streak because the Sports Business Journal put out yesterday the details of the new TV deal with ESPN and Fox going into the Big 12 beginning in 2025, averaging out at about $31.67 million per school, upwards of $50 million when you throw in all the other things that factor in through the NCAA basketball tournament and college football playoff. I mean, point being, BYU is going to get a lot of money when they go into the Big 12. What do you think of that new deal and the figures involved now that BYU is going to participate in that and benefit from that? Yeah, well, people think of the benefit in terms of facilities, and BYU's facilities are nice, but that's what people think about when they think of all this new money's coming in. But more importantly, think about the, the support staff that can be hired now. The top-tier college football programs have entire departments that focus on just scouting, and they scour the nation looking for the kinds of high school and junior college players and the transfer portal that the coaches tell them they're looking for. The coaches give them the criteria. I want this quality and that quality and that quality. They go out and narrow it down, and then the coaches don't get involved until they actually get down to the last few players that they can then decide which ones they want to offer. Whereas if you don't have that kind of staff, the assistant coaches and the head coach are doing all of that work. 
And so you can hire big staffs to do that. You can hire big staffs of consultants because they don't count against the the coach limit. There's a limit of how many actual coaches you can have on the field interacting with the players. But you can have as many consultants as you can bring in. And Alabama famously brings in former head coaches. There's all kind of, that are quality control coaches that help offload some of the busy work from uh, the coaching staff that's actually working with the players and allow them to focus more on actually developing players on and off the field. And so these are things that the, the added revenue will allow BYU to expand. And that will, we talked about punching above your weight a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of schedule, that will help to put BYU up onto the level of the Power Five. It's not just the level of recruiting. It's not just facilities and things like that. It's also the support staff that offloads work from the coaches to allow them to be more effective at the job that the outside world thinks that they should be doing only, which is focusing on the players in football. Great insight from ESPN's Trevor Maddich. I hope you are consuming a huge bag of candy corn following a BYU-Boise State win on Saturday night. Let me put it this way. You, you, if you eat candy corn with your fingers, you can only get a few in your mouth. I eat it with a spoon, <laughs> a big spoon. It's like cereal. <laughs> eat candy corn correctly, people. <laughs> I love it, Trevor. Great to talk.